Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 to 31. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O Israel, how can you say the Lord ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Here is the reading. I want to begin the sermon this morning. I want to tell you a true story. A true story that actually happened to me quite some time ago. I was serving a, a church prior to coming here. It was a much smaller church than this one, which means I was not only the pastor, I was also the custodian, the secretary, the youth minister, and well, anything else that they did. I was all that stuff. So whenever anybody called the church, instead of speaking to a nice secretary like you would hear, uh, the phone on my office would ring. So one day, I was sitting in my desk here, and I was working away, and the phone rings. And I pick it up, and I say, hello. And on the other end of the line is a hysterical voice. And I'm trying to get this person to calm down enough to speak to me so I could understand. And, and when they finally got a breath and slowed down a little bit, I realized what they were saying. They were saying, my mom's house is on fire. Now I asked what I believe to be a perfectly appropriate follow-up question. Did you call someone for help? And you can probably see where this is going. Yes, the hysterical person said, I called you. Now in this town where I lived at that time, they had a volunteer fire department. Now shortly after this experience, I went down and joined the fire department and became a fireman for a while, but I had not joined yet. But I knew that most of the men who were, who were firefighters in that town were not available in the middle of the day because of shift changes and they were at work. I also happened to know where this person's mother lived. So you know what I did. I ran into the sanctuary. I got under the pulpit. I grabbed the fire extinguisher. And I took off running down the road toward the pillar of smoke I saw coming up near the edge of town. So I arrive on scene. The entire family is standing out in the front yard. And without breaking stride, I ran directly in the front door with the fire extinguisher. Now... You know in the movies, how people are in a burning building and they can see and they can talk and all that? Well, let me tell you something, friends. It ain't nothing like that inside of a burning house. So I, I followed the smoke as it got thicker and thicker, trying to figure out where it was starting from, and it led me to the laundry room. The fire was actually in the dryer, but I couldn't see the fire. So I dropped the fire extinguisher, and I grabbed the dryer with both hands and burned my hands. But I managed to get it pulled out from the wall enough that I got down behind it. I unhooked the, the cord and, and the dryer vent and all the stuff from behind it. I jockeyed it around out the door and I shoved it out the back door so hard that it rolled down a hill. In doing so, uh, the door of the dryer came open. And when that big gulp of air went in there, the stuff ignited on the inside and that dryer burned completely up. Now... There was some serious smoke damage to the house, but since the fire department didn't come in with, you know, hoses spraying and all that stuff, there was no water damage. My hands weren't burned too bad, and I coughed a lot the next day or two. But the house was saved because the pastor is a lunatic. Now, I want to be very clear. Under no circumstances do I ever want any of you to do this. Do not run into a burning building without proper precautions. That does not make you a hero. It makes you an idiot. Admittedly, it makes you an idiot with an awesome story, but that's besides the point. As good as that story is, it would not sound nearly as good at my eulogy, which is where it very well could have been shared. Now, the point I want to make with this story is the person who called me for help called the wrong person. I saved that lady's house because I got very lucky. 
I got there before the fire burned out of the dryer and into the wall, at which point there had been no saving the house. Turns out what had happened was is somebody had left a cigarette lighter in the pocket when it heated up in the dryer. It ignited in there, and it was just burning like crazy. By getting the dryer out in the yard, the fire burned itself out before burning into the wall. Now, I was the wrong person to call. And again, I say this. The only reason I was able to help this situation is because I got insanely lucky. But this got me thinking. How often in life do we find ourselves in need of help and we call the wrong person? Again, I want to be as clear of this as I possibly can be. If your house is on fire, do not call Tim. There are trained professionals who deal with that sort of thing. And I have, I have a good reason why I don't want you to call me. The reason I don't want you to call me if your house is on fire is because I am a man, which means I would never allow an insignificant detail like having no idea what I'm doing stop me from trying to do it. So for my own safety, don't call me. All right? But reflecting back on this crazy story got me wondering, how often do we need help? We call the wrong place for help. I have, to this day, I have no idea why the lady called me for help when her mom's house was on fire. I don't know. And we all laugh at the story because it is honestly so ridiculous. But how often do we get to the place where we know we need help, we're facing a situation where we know we can't go it alone, and we direct our cry to help to the wrong place? Example. You have a stressful situation at work. The outcome of the situation is not clear. You don't know what to do. So you look for an answer to your dilemma in the bottom of a bag of chips. Ever look there? Did you find it? No. How about this one? Have an issue in your marriage. And instead of having a rational conversation with your spouse, you take it to somebody who will take your side, tell you what you want to hear no matter how wrong you might be. I played that one. There's somebody in your life you desperately want to have an aggressive conversation with this person. But instead of having an aggressive conversation with that person, you have an aggressive yet very confusing conversation with your kids. Ever done that one? How about this one? Yeah, I know the first one, y'all were like, yeah, we've done that one. Now you're like, mm, I'm going to stay out of this one. How about this one? Somebody in your life stepped out of line, did something that you're upset with them now, and you think that what they did was so egregious, it was so out of line, that they should just know what they did without you having to tell them. In fact, your feelings are hurt by the fact that they don't just know what's going on without you having to say it, and you're angry at that person for not knowing what they did. Ladies, I'm looking at you on this one. Okay? Y'all know that that's, that happens at times, right? Do you know what the single most effective way to not get help is? Look in the wrong place for it. Look for comfort from the wrong person. Look for answers from the wrong authority. Look for guidance from the wrong leader. And help is the last thing you'll find. You look in the wrong place, and not only will you find no help whatsoever, your situation is likely to get worse. My friends, look at our world today. We have people all over the place looking for help, begging, screaming for help. We see evidence of this everywhere. I mean, the suicide rate is going up. Drug abuse has turned into a joke. I mean, it, why? Because everybody's using drugs now, right? Which is not true. Recreational drug use, it's still drug use. It's all designed to look like help while it screws up your life. Alcohol can be the same thing. It's designed to look like help while destroying everything it touches. Smoking. The nicotine looks like it's calming you down, but there's that little cancer side effect that I think we all would agree is not helpful. I mean, we heard it already today. Big event happening tonight, the Super Bowl. The commercials for the Super Bowl are almost a bigger deal than the game itself. So as you're watching the commercials tonight, I want you to have a little social experiment with me. Listen to how convincing those commercials are that this is the thing that you need. 
This is the product that will change your life. Everything in your world will come together if you just get some of whatever it is we're selling. It will be great. All the help you need from one product here. You know the spiel, guys, and you know where it ends. You know it ends in disappointment. At the end of the day, what do we actually want? We want more power and strength. We want new energy when we're tired. We want to soar over the chaos of the world on wings like eagles. That's what we're looking for. We want to be able to run and not be weary. We want to be able to walk without fainting. That's the help everyone is looking for. And those corporations who make those commercials in the Super Bowl, they know it. We will pay handsomely for that kind of help. Corporations know that too. That is what the prophet Isaiah teaches us in this passage. To be a prophet means to speak on behalf of God. So in these verses, Isaiah is speaking on God's behalf. So God's got some stuff he wants to know. To whom are you comparing God? Look at those monster companies out there. Companies like, like Google and Disney and Amazon. They have incredible resources at their disposal. Those resources can create so many wonderful things. They can generate so much money. Those companies have so much power. But ask yourself this. Did Disney hang the stars in the sky? Does Amazon keep the world spinning on its axis? Does the world exist because the Democrats say it does? Does the sun rise in the morning at the Republicans' demand? The answer is no. As much power as all of these entities lay claim to, their power doesn't even begin to compare with God's. So how often do we turn to God for help? I mean real help. Yes, we all pray. Yes, we put our names and our issues out there on prayer chains. Yes, we update our Facebook statuses asking for prayer. Yes, we have all our friends pray for us. That's great. But I want to know how often you legitimately turn to God for help. More than just a token request. And when you get to the point that you break down and ask God for help, how often is your prayer for help just a request for God, will you just fix this? God, will you just do this for me? How often is that the prayer? Now, now, I want you to hear this. I am not going to deny that God has the power to do miracles. Clearly, I am not denying that. In no way do I want to discount that. I know that can happen. But here's my fear. What I'm afraid of is that miracles are the only way we recognize God doing anything. Anything short of a miracle that can be traced back to supernatural origin gives no credit to God at all. See, this passage from the Bible, from Isaiah, truly, I mean, honestly, one of the Bible's most beautiful passages. You know, it's one where we talk quite often about God providing for needs. You see it here. You know, God giving strength. How often, when we need help, do we ask for strength? So my fear is, all of our prayers are all for deliverance. God just, just do it. You know, pull me out of it, whatever. And again, I don't deny that God can do that. God can absolutely do supernatural deliverance. But, what if the answer to your prayer is that God will simply give you more strength? You see, there are so many times we want God to function like a TV commercial. Look, I buy the product. I want this better right now. I don't want to have to work for it. Just build my credit card and fix the problem. That's what we want. Unfortunately, God doesn't work that way. Sometimes we pray that God will deliver us from running and God's answer is to give us strength to run more. I mean, we would re much rather God say, hey, instead of running, can you just paint the finish line right there? Right there in front of me? Put the finish line right there. But God decided, you know, I'm not going to do a miracle like that. I'm just going to empower you to make it to the finish line where it already is. Is that an answer to your prayer? Can God answer a prayer without delivering you from the problem. Now I know, I get it. When the pastor asks a question like this, well, I was supposed to say yes, we're here in church. I'm be sure God answered, can answer prayers without delivering us from our affliction. But I want to challenge you this morning. Really, is that true? I mean, if we're going to soar through the sky on wings like eagles, as the prophet Isaiah says, I think that means you know, many of us will interpret that to mean that God's just going to grab a hold of us and lift us up and float us off into the sky. What if instead 
God just provides you the wings. But in order for you to get to the sky to soar, you're going to have to get yourself off the ground. He will provide the ability to fly. He will give you a beautiful sky to soar into. But if you want to get out of the mess that's holding you down, you're going to have to flap your wings. If you want to lay on the ground and complain about God not doing anything, you're going to have to ask yourself, are you laying on your wings? Are you laying on the wings that God gave you, saying, why don't you get me up off the ground? See, the grace of our Lord is powerful enough to break you loose and let you fly. But if you don't do anything to get off the ground and get going, you won't soar. Even the mighty eagle will lay on the ground until he decides to spread his wings and work. The eagle doesn't fly because God lifts him up. The eagle flies because God enabled the eagle to fly. And the eagle took those wings that God gave him and put them to work. See, my fear is that the world has spoiled us by catering to us. Like Garfield here, right? By handing us everything, making everything convenient and easy. We don't have a concept for struggling and overcoming anymore. This fantastic passage from Isaiah 40, it's about God answering prayers by making us stronger. My fear is, is that strength will do nothing until we decide it's time to fly. It's time for us to soar above the chaos as God empowered us to you. God gave you the strength. He made you strong. And the good Lord is currently in the process of making you even stronger. But as you look at what God has given you and ignore His grace that draws you to Him, friends, if you're not going to use those things, you're never going to get off the ground. You'll never get away from your current circumstances. And as you lay there, all of the tools and the strength that you need to break away and fly are there the whole time. So all the while, you're praying that God will do even more for you. Even though he's already given you the resources, relationships, and the opportunities that you need to fly and whatever that means to you. The whole time, everything you need is right there and you're continuing to pray, God, you've not done enough for me yet. It's hard. But if you want to get off the ground, you have to get yourself off the ground. So let me, let me close this up and get ready for communion this morning just by, by researching this with you together. If your life is missing something, if there's something heavy holding you back, if there's a relationship you have that's struggling, I, I am asking you to ask yourself whether or not God has already given you what you need for healing to begin. Is it possible that what needs to happen is you need to use the strength that God gave you and take that strength and do whatever it is that the devil's telling you cannot be done. There's nothing sadder in this world than to watch a person lay on the ground and cry out for help while they are laying on a perfectly good set of God-given wings. My friends, don't do it. Isaiah says he wants us to soar like eagles, to fly. He's empowered you to do that. But if you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, you're going to have to go there. You're going to have to get yourself up off the ground. Now, here's the cool part of today. We're going to practice. Because what happens when we, when we do this? What do I make you do? I mean, I make you move out of your pew and come forward, right? You're going to practice baby steps. You know, if you're in a place in your life where you don't want to be and you want to be someplace else, what do you have to do? Move. Do something. And we're going to practice that here this morning. Because look, it's laid out here on the table. Body broken, shed blood of Christ. It's going to be right here. We're going to share that together. However, you know, unless you have mobility issues and then we'll help you out. Outside of that, if you want it, it's up here. You're going to have to move and get it. So my friends, as we're thinking about God empowering us through his strength, his wisdom, his knowledge, his, his courage, his guidance, whatever it is, as we're thinking about that this morning, let's take a moment and ask God to bless us in that journey. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you have called us to something better than where we are now. Even if right now where we are is great, you have called us to go upward, onward and upward. And God, for that opportunity, we are 
just ridiculously grateful. But God, we also know we've all either been in seasons of life or maybe we are currently in a season of life where we got something going on we don't like, we don't want, we're not interested in. We want to go on to something else. God, for all of us who may be in that place of our lives, in a certain phase of our lives, we pray this morning. We pray for what you may give us, be it strength or endurance, so that we can continue to run, to run the race that you have set before us. We pray, God, for healing, for wholeness, for wisdom and discernment, for guidance and direction, so that we may be able to, to move forward instead of just running in circles, so that we can move closer to your will, which may move us out of the rut that we're stuck in. But God, toward that end, we know that we cannot do this, nor will we be able to approach it without at least being able to embrace your presence. So God, we invite you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us who are gathered here in these gifts that are here on this table. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. We pray, God, that in this moment of stepping and moving, that we can realize that there may be another area of our life that we need to step and move, that we need to go forward. And we ask, God, that this might be the motivation, the strength, and the courage that we need to do just that. Thank you for being here among us today, and we ask, God, your blessing to, to go toward whatever your goal for us happens to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.